Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to our channel and thanks for logging on. If you enjoy these videos, do me a favor and subscribe to our YouTube channel right here at Watchbox Reviews because today we have another versus head to head. It's Switzerland versus Japan in a battle of stainless steel dive watches, two of the stars of 2018's model year. We have the Seiko Prospects Diver High Beat SLA 025 1968 recreation and we have the Omega Seamaster Professional Diver 300 meter, the quarter century immortal of the Seamaster line. Let's go head to head and let's start with the Seiko. I'm starting with the Seiko because it will be the less familiar of the two. Both of these watches were standout debuts back at Basel in 2018. The Seiko perhaps just a bit more special for its rarity. This watch is a recreation of the first high beat diver, the 1968 Seiko 6159-7. 7001. The timepiece, almost a line for line, millimeter for millimeter re edition. It lives up to its name as a recreation, and technically it's part of the vintage re edition fad, but it is so distinctively Seiko in its character that it's tough to lump it in with any other watches in a category. The timepiece stands alone, and for many considering this watch, there is no competitive equivalent because it will be marketed exclusively to Seiko fans and nostalgic Seiko fans at that. But you can see on my wrist, 16 centimeters in circumference, it wears quite easily. Despite being a big watch at 44.8 millimeters, it doesn't wear quite that large. A lot of that's down to the spacing of the lugs. 50.8 millimeters lug to lug across my 16 centimeter circumference wrist, it actually wears quite well. A big part of that is the flat case back, which then and now, designed to sit flush against a wrist, improves the comfort of the timepiece. Nor is it terribly thin for what it is. 15.5 uh, millimeters, so that 15.5, relatively slim in large part due a monoblock case construction with no discrete removable case back. The spacing between the lugs is a vintage nostalgic 19 millimeters, and the timepiece does feature a silicone strap with a vintage sort of tropic pyramid as well as striated pattern. It's a high grade piece though with a metal strap minder and a handsome stainless steel pin buckle. The watch, as I mentioned, is superb in its construction with a monoblock case that's flat across the back. And because the strap is drilled so close to the case, it seems highly integrated. And you can see how you can pull that straight down around a small wrist. Strap tool apertures present and correct Seiko, as ever, encourages you to swap out to other straps to change the look of your watch to coordinate with your mood or requirements. So we'll show it on the wrist one more time, then we'll jump to the Omega. I should mention that the silicone strap, because it's not vulcanized rubber, is a gummy style strap that is incredibly soft and comfortable exactly what you want on your wrist when you're dealing with sweat, grit, moisture, and or salt water. Now jump into the Omega. I should mention that the Omega's design is in its own way a bit of an Omega heritage piece. It's not a re-edition, it's a continuous edition as the first watch to this design debuted back in 1993, what was then the, the Basel Watch and Jewelry Show. A quarter century is a long time for any given Omega design other than the Moon Watch to endure, and the fact that this one's made it to 25 years suggests that Omega finally has a true time-tested, enduring design signature to rival the Rolex Submariner, and for good measure, they've both been worn by Bond. 42 millimeters, the watch is larger for 2018 than the previous 41 millimeter. It's also a little bit thicker at 13.7, but still considerably thinner than the Seiko. Lug to lug, I measured this one at 49.5 millimeters, so it is a little bit narrower across the wrist than the Seiko. The strap is a bit more form fit, as you can see, because it closes ranks with the lugs as well as the case band, it doesn't have quite the straight pull flexibility that you get on the Seiko, and the fact that this is vulcanized rubber bodes well for its durability, but it's not quite as gummy and soft or flexible as the strap on the Seiko. It is a handsome piece, though, designed expressly for this generation of the watch. It has the wave pattern on the bottom that recaps both the arabesque of the movement finish and the ceramic laser etched dial. The pin buckle is simple and handsome, and again, this is a design that was executed specifically for this generation of watch. You can see the flare of the bevel as well as the contrast between the satin of the buckle and the pin, and the relieved and polished Omega logo raised up a attention to detail to the nth degree. The case band is simple and you can see there's a great deal of philosophical difference between these two. The Omega case with its lyre style lugs and flared bevels has been around since the mid 60s and well the Grand Seiko finished case branded Seiko here, has been around since 1968, and that warrants some explanation. This is a Seiko watch with a Grand Seiko movement and Grand Seiko case finish that is actually produced in Grand Seiko's Shizuku Ishii exclusive studio for their higher-end mechanical watches. So the Shizuku Ishii 
Iwate Prefecture manufacture is specific to the Grand Seiko watches and a couple of very special Seiko models. And this was a 1500 piece limited edition that certainly qualified. So this is more than the average bear, both in terms of price and spec among Seiko watches. Now, of course, the Omega featuring a 20 millimeter lug spacing, so I should compare them once more in profile. You can see what they were like when they were crystal to crystal in terms of thickness and bulk, but you can also see that when you look at them head on, the narrow spacing of the original Seiko is recreated, whereas the Omega is just a bit broader. Now let's talk about the advantages of these two watches. You've seen them both on the wrist, the Omega to good advantage, and we'll show it broad one more time just so you can see it in proportion, but the Omega is a watch that wears flush, fits easily, and could be imagined as an everyday timepiece, more so than the Seiko. And that's the first advantage of the Omega. Slimmer, more elegant, arguably more versatile. Let's also talk about tech. It's not just the fact that the Omega has a display case back and lets you see that for which you've paid. There are many refinements. It meets and exceeds the COSC chronometer standard, internationally known as ISO 3159. It's also a full METAS chronometer, so adjusted in six positions, not five, with a full cased up test of anti-magnetic resistance because this is effectively an amagnetic watch with its silicon hairspring and other feather in its cap versus the Seiko. It has the same 55 hour power reserve, but a full balance bridge with a free sprung balance for greater shock resistance. And that Meitaz chronometer test does involve full cased up testing of the watch, plus a test of power reserve and winding efficiency and anti-magnetism. It features the tri-level coaxial escapement as designed by George Daniels, industrialized and perfected by Omega. And like Grand Seiko and Seiko, Swatch Group and thus Omega, a fully integrated manufacturer making their own lubricants, their own stones, as well as their own shock protection. These are manufactured products through and through. I should also mention that price is on the side of the Omega, which costs $4,750 if you buy it new. Pre-owned, these are selling for about $3,000. So they don't lose a lot of value, but you are getting an excellent deal whether you buy one of these new or pre-owned. And if you buy new, five-year warranty versus three for the Seiko Advantage Omega. The rubber strap, though not quite as supple as the gummy silicone on the Seiko, will last longer. Vulcanized rubber is tougher, it has a longer life on the wrist. And in terms of specification, the Omega features a ceramic bezel insert with white enamel inlay versus the amorphous diamond-like carbon or ADLC that you'll find on the Seiko. Ultimately, the watch is slimmer, less bulky, more technically adept, offers higher grade materials, including on the ceramic laser etched dial with all applique indices, and it simply feels like a more expensive watch than it is. You're getting a great deal whether you buy this watch new or pre-owned. Now let's jump to the Seiko and talk about its advantages, and there are quite a few. First, rarity. Seiko and Grand Seiko, not as frequently seen in the luxury class as Omega, Rolex, and Tag Heuer. And the timepiece does have impressive credentials as a store of value. While the $5,400 new price is extraordinary for a Seiko, and three, four years ago would have been Grand Seiko price territory, nevertheless, you see a lot of these selling pre-owned for six to six and a half thousand dollars. So the price seems honest based on its ability to hold and even gain value. Also, on a loom basis, the Seiko blows the Omega out of the water. I'll show you the loom shot later on, it's far better on the Seiko. There is no contest. I won't have to explain in the dark which is which. 1,500 pieces created, so it's not just that Seiko and Grand Seiko are rare in the luxury class, but with 1,500 of these made versus tens of thousands of the Omega every single year, you're unlikely to ever see another one of these unless you encounter another member of the Seiko luxury fraternity. The timepiece does have impressive wrist stance, and if you have a very large wrist, you might opt for this over a bulky planted oak. Ocean. That's right, I would compare this to the Omega Planet Ocean in wrist stance and overall quality. Now let's talk a little bit about the bezel refinement. This bezel simply feels more expensive. It's creamy, it's crisp, at the same time, difficult to do. 120 clicks, I would compare it favorably to Rolex and Blancpain, and that is about as good as it gets in terms of comparables. For refinement, this bezel is far better than the Omega. It feels and sounds better, but it's also easier to grip. As you can see, the knurling is sharp and vertical, whereas on the Omega, it's it's almost beveled. It's, it's handsome, it's subtle, it makes the watch wear well as a dress piece, but it's also the darndest thing to grip with wet, sweaty, or gloved hands. These watches are both priced such that you would absolutely consider using them for diving, at least recreationally, and the Seiko is better on that count. Moreover, 
No need for the helium escape valve. This is like a eye on a potato or a wart on a hog, whereas here we have a sophisticated monoblock case so there's no case back to remove. Everything loads through the front. As a result of that construction and sophisticated seals, helium can't enter this watch, therefore it has no need to exit this watch. That's impressive and it is real value. Plus, this watch has a feather in its cap that the Omega has never earned and that is a GPHG win. In 2018, this was the GPHG laureate for the best sports model. Model prize, and that's considering it's a Japanese watch competing in a predominantly Swiss category at a Swiss awards show. Very nicely done. So which of these two do I prefer? Well, there's no denying that this is a $5,400 Seiko, and it feels and looks and wears $5,400. No reservations about the pricing of this one. That said, on a practical basis, I prefer the slimmer profile of the Omega. It is considerably thinner, more versatile, it's handsome, it's enduring. I like the fact that it's a full -time watch, not an occasional watch or a weekend watch. That gives it considerable value as opposed to the Seiko, which you might have to purchase along with a Presage model to allow you to have two watches, one for the weekend, one for the office. The Omega also, accessible at a lower price, whether you buy new or pre-owned, appeals to me on that basis. The tech appeal is undeniable, from the silicon hairspring to the coaxial escapement to the six position regulation and the Matas chronometer certification. The Omega will beat the minus four plus six timing precision that is the bare minimum for the COSC and it will exceed that whereas the Seiko is rated by Seiko as no better than minus 10 plus 15 seconds a day. This will beat the Seiko handily on that front. I like the fact that you can see the movement. It's a handsome movement. Though both are machine finished Omega lets you see that for which you've paid and it's important to me that with an extra two years of warranty Omega has your back. Plus this watch has been around in basically the same form while being considerably updated from a tech standpoint. For for 25 years, it stood the test of time. It's not part of the modern glut of vintage re-editions or retro rehashes. The Seiko, as loving a recreation as it is, definitely is part of that trend. I'm happy with a watch that's more like a Porsche 911 Evergreen than a watch that's a revival. So you guys let me know which of the two is for you. The Omega's for me, but there's no knocking the Seiko objectively. Let me know in the comment box below which of the two you favor for your own collection. I like the differential loom on the minute hand and bezel of the Omega, but in terms of brightness, it's the Seiko by a mile.